These old ruins remind us of how temporary are man's structures, and in contrast, how enduring are those mountains, or at least so they seem to our limited experience. But geology tells us that this landscape behind us has changed greatly over many millions of years and that the earth has a long and a complicated history. And yet, we see no evidence of change even during a whole lifetime. So how do we know that the earth actually has changed? Well, as we'll see, there is evidence in the rocks themselves. To unravel the mystery of what's happened in the earth's past, geologists must act like detectives. They've got to ask the right questions, search for clues, and then put these together to make some sense. Now this area here around Boulder, Colorado is one of the best areas in the entire United States to show you how we know the earth has a history. All the evidence we need is within sight of these ruins, and yet the principles that we learn can be applied anywhere. So let's go exploring. First, let's take a look at the landscape as it is today. Boulder sits at the base of the eastern foothills of the Rocky Mountains, below the rugged snow-capped peaks of the Continental Divide. As the winter snows melt high in the mountains, trickles of water become rivulets, and brooks turn into rushing streams, cascading down through rock-filled canyons to reach the mountain front. There, the streams begin a meandering journey across the vast central continental plains, eventually joining together as they flow eastward toward the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. This is a good place to begin learning about geological history, here in the bed of South Boulder Creek. If we were asked to describe this stream, we'd probably mention the cool water and the babbling sounds and maybe the rich foliage along the banks. But for our purposes, we're going to concentrate on gravel and sandbars. These pebbles are all pieces of rock that were eroded away from the mountains and carried here by the stream. The types of rocks that make up the pebbles are great clues to the types of rocks in the mountains. Notice also how round and smooth they are. This is a characteristic of pebbles in any stream bed. In the steep canyon where South Boulder Creek is swift and powerful, it can transport good-sized boulders, rounding them by constant tumbling and grinding them smaller and smaller as it carries them along. Near the mouth of the canyon, the water slows down enough so that it begins to drop the heavier pebbles and boulders, except during floods. Only smaller pebbles continue downstream. Gradually, even these wear down until they become sand or silt. At this spot, of course, we can't see the sand and the pebbles in motion because the stream energy is too low. But if I disturb the sediments, the fine grains are picked up by the current and carried away to be deposited downstream. Now, imagine the material that can be transported by a heavy spring runoff or a major flood. A really big flood, the kind that happens only once a thousand years or so, might end up depositing several feet of sand or pebbles at a time over a wide area. But usually the process is very slow. In between floods, there may be very little actual accumulation. So far, we've learned that stream bottoms consist of mixed patches of sand and pebbles, and that the pebbles have been rounded by the tumbling action of the stream. With that in mind, let's examine our second set of clues further downstream alongside the creek where some gravel pits are being mined. Mining operations like this cut a cross section in the earth and let us see what lies beneath the surface. The first thing we notice are the different layers. When we look at them more closely, we see that these layers are made up largely of sand and gravel, similar to what we just saw in South Boulder Creek. What does this tell us? First, the round shape of the pebbles, as well as the beds of sand, are strong evidence that this is an old stream deposit. Even though the creek has long since left this spot, the evidence remains behind. The separate layers make up a kind of historical record, somewhat like tree rings, but less regular. If each layer represents a major flood, there must have been several such floods here, perhaps separated by several hundreds of years. The layering we see here also illustrates two basic principles that are important in studying geological history. First, notice that the layers are more or less horizontal. That's the natural position for all sediment layers when they're first deposited. We call this the principle of original horizontality. We'll see why this is important shortly. The second principle is called superposition. 
What it means is that in any succession of sedimentary layers, the oldest layer is always on the bottom, and the youngest layer is always on the top. Until now, all we've looked at is loose sand and pebbles, in a stream bed and in a former stream bed. What does this have to do with the study of rocks? Well, we're about to find out. One of the most prominent features of the Boulder landscape is a massive slanted formation of reddish-colored rock known as the Flatirons, which runs along the face of the mountains. This formation is what we want to look at next. But since it's hard to get to right here, we'll head for some nearby exposures of the formation that we can reach by road on the front of Flagstaff Mountain. This is a popular place with hikers and rock climbers but I bet that the people who climb over these rocks have never really observed them carefully. Or at least they've never noticed the clues that we're going to discover. If we examine these rocks closely, we see not only that they are in layers, but that the layers are made of sand grains and rounded pebbles, very similar to those we saw in the gravel pit. Thus, it's logical to assume that these layers also originated as stream deposits and were once loose sand and gravel, but were later cemented together by natural materials to form rock. For obvious reasons, we call this type of rock sandstone. Sandstone is one of a general class of rocks known as sedimentary, because they originate from sediments that accumulate at the bottom of a stream, a lake, or an ocean, or in other cases on dry land, such as windblown sand dunes. The other thing we notice about these sandstone layers is that they're tilted. Remember, we established earlier that the natural layering in stream deposits is basically horizontal. So something must have caused these rocks to tilt after they were formed. Geologists now know that such tilting results from powerful forces that deform the Earth's crust. For our purposes here, we don't need to understand exactly how the tilting happened, just that it did. Note that the rocks here are tilted downward toward the plains at about the same angle as the flat irons. If we could take a closer look at the flat irons, we would find that they are sandstones, just like those on Flagstaff Mountain. So we can infer that these layers were once continuous along the mountain front, and that they have been eroded away across the mouths of the canyons. Another thing we know is that according to the law of superposition, the bottom layers against the mountain are the oldest, and the upper layers, the ones closest to the plains, are the youngest. As we walk away from the mountain front, we observe that the tilt of the rocks remains the same. Thus, we are going past older and older layers in this direction, and downward through a stack of sedimentary rocks. Each layer we cross is older than the one before. But all of a sudden, the well-defined layers disappear, and the rocks below look totally different. The little bit of layering that we do see runs in all directions. Apparently, we've come to the bottom of the sandstone stack. The contact is the old land surface on which the sand was deposited. This kind of contact is called an unconformity. We can see this unconformity even more clearly at another spot on the mountain. Here again, we have the tilted red sandstone at the bottom of our stack. By using the principle of superposition, we know that the unlayered rock beneath it is older than the red sandstone. Notice the lens-shaped pocket of large rounded pebbles along the contact. That's evidence that a stream once flowed here along the ancient land surface. But then the surface wasn't steep like this. How do we know that? Because the layers with the pebbles are now tilted. According to our principle of original horizontality, when the overlying sandstone layers formed, they, and thus the land surface, were pretty nearly horizontal. Think for a moment about how long it must have taken to form the flat irons. First, layer upon layer of sand and pebbles had to be deposited. Then, the layers had to be cemented together to create sandstone. Finally, they had to be tilted to their present position and eroded to their present shape. Each of those processes is very, very slow, and must have taken many thousands of years perhaps hundreds of thousands. But the rocks that make the flat irons, as long as they took to form, represent only a short period of geological history. For more of our story, we need to travel a little ways north to examine Dakota Ridge, a narrow ridge that runs parallel to the front of the mountains.
A good detective knows where to look for clues. We can best see what makes up the Dakota Ridge in a road cut through the ridge at the north edge of Boulder. Here we have a contact between different colored rocks. Using our deductive powers, what can we tell about these rocks? Well, first we can see both red and white rocks. They are layered, which indicates that they are sedimentary rocks. They're also tilted at about the same angle as the rocks we just saw behind us that make up the front of Flagstaff Mountain and the Flatirons. But when we look at them closely, it's obvious that they're not exactly the same. The white rock is a sandstone, but the grains are much smaller and there aren't any pebbles. The red layers beneath the white sandstone are a mixture of sandstone and shale, another kind of sedimentary rock formed from fine clay particles. So here we have another stack of rocks that was deposited horizontally and then tilted at some later point in time. The Dakota Ridge exists because some sedimentary layers are more resistant to erosion than other layers. The softer layers have been removed more easily and the result is the valley behind the ridge. How do the sedimentary rocks forming Dakota Ridge relate to those that form the Flatirons in Flagstaff Mountain? Well, let's travel back in time like we did on Flagstaff Mountain and see what lies beneath these rocks. As we continue to our left into the mountains, we cross successively older layers of the red shale. Then we find that they rest on a still older unit of tilted white sandstone. The white sandstone itself rests on yet another tilted unit, which turns out to be the red sandstone with pebbles the same unit we saw earlier at the bottom of the tilted sequence on Flagstaff Mountain. So our stack of rocks is much thicker than we thought. In fact, although we've seen the bottom, we still haven't seen the top. A very thick unit of tilted gray shale underlies the plains to our right. All of the sediments that make up these rocks were laid down one on top of the other to form a stack more than a mile thick. It must have required vast amounts of time to build this stack. But why didn't we see all the layers when we were on Flagstaff Mountain? Simple, because they've been eroded away there and only the lower layers of pebbly red sandstone remain on the high slopes. However, along the base of the slope, these tilted layers are still present. We have one more stop to make in our search for clues. This time we'll head south of the Flatirons to El Dorado Canyon, where South Boulder Creek begins. Fast-flowing streams, like road cuts, slice through mountains and often reveal useful geologic information that would otherwise be hidden from view. As we enter the canyon, in effect, we're traveling backward through geologic time. Our object is to try to see more of what lies below the tilted stack of sedimentary rocks. Is there evidence that can extend the historical record even longer? The answer lies in those white outcrops ahead. Here on the ground, we can see that this outcrop is also made up of layered rock. This is another white sandstone. Could it also be a part of our tilted stack? Well, from another vantage point, we can get a better view of this part of the canyon. From here, we see a most interesting sight. The band of white sandstones extends up the far slope and intersects the tilted red pebbly sandstones that further north form the Flatirons. Since this band lies below the red pebbly sandstones, it must, by the principle of superposition, be older. But its layers are tilted at a different angle. Thus, it must have been tilted at some earlier time, before the red sandstones and the other layers of that tilted stack were laid down. The contact between these two sets of rocks is a special kind of unconformity called an angular unconformity. This kind of unconformity is especially important for working out geological history because it marks a division between two different sequences of events. So far, we've discovered important clues at several different sites, and we've learned some of the principles that geologists apply to the study of sedimentary rocks. Now it's time to begin assembling those clues and reconstructing the geological history of Boulder Valley. If we could see a cross-section from the mountain front out onto the plains, it would look something like this. 
The youngest materials on the plains are the sands and gravels in the present valley of South Boulder Creek. The next older materials are the gray shales, the white and red rocks of Dakota Ridge in the valley behind, and the red pebbly sandstones that form the flat irons. These must all have been tilted before the present stream formed its valley. Still older are the tilted white sandstones in El Dorado Canyon and the unlayered rocks on Flagstaff Mountain, because both of these lie beneath the oldest rocks of the tilted stack. From what we've learned, we can now describe the major happenings in the geological history of Boulder Valley. Our starting point is the deposition of the white sandstones in El Dorado Canyon, the earliest event for which we have evidence. We don't know the ancient surface on which they were deposited, but perhaps it was made up of rocks similar to the unlayered rocks of Flagstaff Mountain. At some later time, the crust of the earth was deformed and the sandstones were tilted. During this time, the rock layers were also being eroded to form a new land surface. Then a new cycle of deposition began, first with the pebbly red sandstones that now form the flat irons, followed by several different kinds of sedimentary rocks. A second white sandstone, the red shales and sandstones that now floor the valley behind Dakota Ridge, the white sandstones of Dakota Ridge, and the thick pile of gray shales. Still later, this whole stack was tilted along with the underlying rocks. Another cycle of erosion produced the landscape that we know today. Note that the white sandstones of El Dorado Canyon have thus been tilted twice. Now as we look out over Boulder Valley, we understand a great deal more about its geological history. We've learned about sedimentary rocks. We've discovered how to read and interpret some of the clues about environments that they represent. We've learned the significance of angular unconformities. And we've learned the meaning of rock layers that are no longer horizontal. Not every area will reveal its secrets as openly as Boulder Valley, but the simple concepts that we've learned here can be used to work out geological history wherever layers of sedimentary rock are exposed. By studying the rocks, we've come to realize that great changes have occurred in this region. Periods of deposition have been followed by periods during which the Earth's crust has been deformed, and then by periods of erosion. Then the cycle has begun again with more deposition, more deformation, and more erosion. The process of change is continuous. We can't see either a beginning or an end of the story. The scale of time must be very, very great. Consider this. As long as human beings have lived in the Boulder Valley, long before the settlers when there were only Indians, for centuries and perhaps for thousands of years, the only landscape that man has ever known is the landscape we see today. That's how slowly this land has been changing. And yet we've seen clear evidence of how much it has changed. This is the evidence for geologic time. For such changes to have occurred, for such events to have taken place, it must have taken an amount of time so vast that we can hardly imagine it. The Earth does indeed have a long and varied history, especially when compared to human history. Now that you've seen how to use simple clues to work out geologic history, try looking around where you live, looking for similar clues, and working out the geologic history of your area.